Good morning, everyone. Um, as I'm sure you are aware, it's a really big day today. It's the anniversary of the Penny Black. Um, I am here with Dr. Rob McLennan Smith, who is the direct descendant of Roland Hill, the gentleman who invented the Penny Black. He is going to present the founder of the adhesive postage stamp. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. It's a great pleasure to be hosting this. It's a very interesting bit of history. Now, I don't claim to be a great uh, philatelist. I'm more of a collector of postal history, uh, the um, Mulready caricatures, Victorian pictorial envelopes, and obviously everything to do with, with Roland. Um, now, Roland was a particularly uh, gifted man. He started off as a teacher, and um, him and his family um, reformed the whole of the, the teaching the way it was done in those days. He was an inventor, an artist, architect, and, and as we all know, postal reformer and the developer of the world's first postage stamp. He was born in 1795 and he lived to a ripe old age of, of 84. And I'm going to start uh, with a tribute from four times Prime Minister William Gladstone, who was a good friend of Roland's. And he was talking about or paying a tribute to Roland just before his burial in Westminster Abbey. And he said, his great plan ran like wildfire through the civilized world. Never perhaps was a local invention and improvement applied in the lifetime of its author to the advantages of such vast multitudes of his fellow creatures. I think that's a really great tribute to him. So here's our, our family tree. Um, I'm a direct descendant of Arthur, and here you see a picture of Arthur on the right here, with Roland's brother. Um, we have a, a lovely um, photo album of all of the family from back in those days, which we'll be showing you. So Arthur and Roland were uh, of eight siblings from Thomas Wright Hill and Sarah Lee, and we'll be talking a little bit about our, uh, these siblings. And there were very, three very famous Roland Hills in the 1800s. And we'll talk to those about this as well. And they all descend from William Hill here. And he was the brother of the very first Lord Mayor of London, Sir Roland Hill. And we'll take you through the family tree as we go along. This is the um, first of the Roland Hills. He was a reverend. And he was a very famous reverend. He was very outspoken, very evangelical, very popular, uh, a friend of Edward Jenner and, and a very influential advocate, advocate in uh, smallpox vaccination. And uh, our Roland Hill was actually named after this reverend because uh, Roland's parents and grandparents were very, very keen or very uh, like this particular Roland Hill. Then there was the very famous general, General Roland Hill. He was Viscount Hill, um, and he was uh, second in command in the Napoleonic Wars under the Duke of Wellington. Uh, when the Duke of Wellington went into politics and became prime minister, uh, General Roland Hill took over as commander in chief of the British army in 1828. So these are the three of Roland's siblings. Um, all three of them were great reformers, along with Roland. When they were young, they all reformed, along with their father, the school system. Uh, then Matthew Davenport, who was a lawyer, he reformed the English prisons, and in particular, the penal code. Now, in those days, it was extremely harsh. There were 150 crimes that got the death penalty, um, and Matthew got that down to three crimes at the end of the day. Frederick was a prisons inspector, and he reformed the prisons tremendously because the prisons in those days were quite horrific. Um, and he reformed them to try and rehabilitate the prisoners. And then he joined Roland in the post office in 1851 as his assistant. Then Edwin, uh, he joined the post office as well. He was the first British controller of stamps. And then in 1851, he invented a letter folding machine, which is was exhibited at the Crystal Palace Great Exhibition of um, 1853. Roland's children, these are also pictures from the family album here. Uh, he had three daughters, Louisa, Clara, 
um, and Eleanor Caroline. And I can't find a photograph or a picture anywhere of Eleanor, but she was actually the most famous of the sisters. Uh, she became Roland's private secretary for 25 years. And because she had such close knowledge of Roland, she wrote this book about him um, in print in 1907, which was the story of a great reform. And the most famous of his children was Pearson. Uh, Pearson joined the post office in 1850, and most uh, philatelists will be familiar with his the very first cancellation machine, which was developed in 1857. And here it is here, an example of, of a Pearson Hill Type 1A cancellation. Then my great-great-grandfather was Edward Bernard, Bernard Lewin Hill, known as Lewin, and he was the assistant postmaster general from 1881. He was a very keen autograph collector and collector of letters from VIPs. And um, some of these have survived through the years. Then this is my grandparents, uh, Arthur Bernard Hill, Kathleen Buchanan. And they had four children. That's my mom here and Carolyn. And then Bob. Now, Bob's a teacher in True Hill tradition. And we have a Roland, my uncle, who's the historian. And he's traced back. Uh, the Hill family way back to the French roots, actually, back uh, about a century. Here's my folks. My dad sadly passed away about two years back. He was the uh, very keen collector. He started about 50 years ago, and he put together most of the caricatures, which I've then uh, expanded on. My mom is still alive and well. She's a great artist. Um, and. Uh, I have uh, four siblings. So the story of uh, Roland Hill in his early years, he was born 13 December 1795 in Kidderminster. This is the picture of the house here. Uh, it had been in the family for about a century. And then the Napoleonic Wars uh, hit England hard. Thomas fell on hard times. And they had to move to a small farmhouse outside Wolverhampton. and. Um, Rhoda's dad had to work in a brass foundry for a meager pay. Um, and then, then they managed to buy a small school from a friend of theirs, and uh, they moved to the school in Birmingham. And then that did quite well. And a few months later, they moved to a bigger house called Hilltop School. Sorry. Okay. This, this is uh, Roland's parents here, Thomas Wright and Sarah Lee. Now, Roland was a very sick child. He had scarlet fever when he was uh, an infant and a very sickly child. He probably developed rheumatic heart disease from the scarlet fever, and uh, which causes a condition called mitral stenosis. As Roland was never a healthy man, um, and he was always tired, often off sick. But uh, he lived to a healthy age of, of 84. He also had a spinal condition, which I'm not sure exactly what it was, but it kept him bedridden for about two years in his early childhood. And he was only seven before he was well enough to begin to learn to read and write. But when he did, he excelled himself. By the age of 12, he was already tutoring at his father's school, teaching astronomy, navigation, architecture, mathematics. He also earned extra money fixing scientific instruments working with uh, his brother Edwin at the Silver Assay Office, um, and he painted landscapes in his spare time. He was quite a good artist, actually. He, um, age 13, he won a national competition for landscapes uh, painting for under 16s. So um, he carried on painting through, through much of his life. At age 24, they moved the school from Hilltop uh, to Edge Baston, and they started the famous Hazelwood School, with Roland being the architect of the school. Uh, and it was aimed at emerging middle classes, pupil centered, science compulsory, and students were to be self governing. And Roland included marvels for the time. They had science labs, swimming pools, and the first for schooling, they had forced uh, air heating. And this is a bit of a busy slide, but uh, it shows all the nature of the reforms that they did in those days. Uh, in particular, they did this. They, they treated with kindness instead of the usual corporal punishment and, and 
uh, moral influence rather than fear. They introduced school magazines, they used tokens rewarding good work. They were pioneers in the science, but uh, they had a lot of resistance to it and uh, they had to stop uh, the science after a few years. And an important thing was this, they, they taught pupils to earn a future livelihood. And I think that's a, a, an amazing thing. Um, and their boys were all self-governing. If you look here, a paper from 1843, they say the system of educated advocated by Arthur, it's been tried for a series, series of years, offers best results. While at school, the boys, even then in their sports, acquire the habits of thinking men. So I think that's a great uh, tribute to Arthur. Then they moved the school uh, to London and they opened the branch in Bruce Castle, Tottenham, with Rowland starting as the first headmaster. And the school proved so popular that the boys transferred in their numbers from uh, Birmingham down to, to this Hazelwood. You can see the headmasters were Rowland and then my grandfather here, you can see Arthur, uh, sitting in the grounds of Bruce Castle. Then Arthur's son, Burbeck, and finally uh, the Reverend William Elmack. Now I'm going to go a little bit into Bruce Castle. It's a fascinating uh, building and it's uh, still uh, visitable today. It's now a museum with beautiful grounds. It was originally uh, owned by the House of Bruce. And um, when during the battles with uh, the English and Edward and Robert the Bruce. And uh, it was handed over to the English after the Scottish got their independence. And so the, the House of Bruce lost the land to the English, but it still maintains the, the name, Bruce Castle. And this uh, brick building was built um, in I think about the 16th century. And it's, no, it's thought to be one of the oldest surviving English uh, brick houses in, in the country. On the grounds as well, there's this very interesting building. Uh, it's a round tower that extends deep underground and historians think that this is actually, it's called the Hawk Muse, um, where they kept the hawks for training. And it's thought to be the only remaining Hawk Muse in Britain. So uh, all of these, um, uh, the grounds and the buildings are open to the public now. I see you can go and uh, visit Bruce Castle. There's a little museum there as well, um, which um, shows a little bit about the personal history of it. And there's a, there's a very nice big painting of Arthur there in the grounds as well. <clears throat> I'll share this letter with you. It's a very interesting piece of history. Um, I got this uh, from Ian Shapiro, who was, I think he was talking one or two days back. Uh, he's from Spink, and he found this letter from uh, Charles Babbage, the inventor of the computer, who was sent to Roland at Bruce Castle uh, on October 27, in 1827. Um, and it concerns uh, the son of Charles Babbage. He had two sons there. This is uh, Herschel Babbage. He had a younger brother, Charles Whitmore, who died in July 1827, a few months before the letter was sent. Um, and in the, the letter, or in 1827, should I say, it was a very tragic year for Charles Babbage. He lost his dad, um, but his dad left him with a big fortune, which uh, helped him to develop the computer. But then, as mentioned, his son died at the age of 10. A month later, his wife, Georgiana, contracted an illness and she and her newborn son died in September. And this caused Charles to have a mental breakdown which delayed the construction of his machines. Um, at the end of 1827, he made a long year long trip through Europe and meeting the scientists. And when he got back, he developed the, the computer. And here is the, the letter. Uh, what, in the letter, he's speaking to Roland and he's saying, he wants to go away for this pilgrimage to Europe and he wants to just see his son for a weekend. And could he pick him up uh, to take him out to, to see him for a weekend? And the end, he says, the papers have informed us all of your recent marriage. May you be blessed as I have been and may your fortitude never be put to so severe a test as mine, which has almost given way. Um, quite a historic letter. Uh, Charles Babbage came back and developed the interference engines and eventually. Relative to the computer. 
Roland himself was a great inventor. He invented many things whilst he was a, a school teacher. Screw propellers for steamboats, road making machinery, compressing gas through small pipes, uh, pendulums for observations of astronomical observations. This uh, underground pneumatic railway system, which actually worked uh, between two of the post offices for a while, um, uh, then was shelved. He also started getting involved in the postal system, checking speeds of stagecoaches, and a plan for sorting and and stamping letters on the road whilst they were in the mail coaches. 1832, he wrote a paper called The Home Colonies, a plan for gradual extinction by education of pauperism and crime. That never really came to anything. But then in 1835, he was uh, appointed to become the secretary of the South Australian Colonization Commission. And Roland was instrumental in um, the formation of Adelaide, and this is a statement from uh, Roland where he says he wanted to develop a colony without convicts to embody the best qualities of British society, shaped by religious freedom and a commitment to social progress and civil liberties, which uh, it's hope he got right. He was also involved in this society for the diffusion of useful knowledge with his brothers, Matthew and Edwin. So they were intolerant of the cheap and offensive literature that was predominant at the time, and they wanted to produce some good, inexpensive uh, scientific material for the public. And they published this journal called the Penny Post, and Charles Knight, the editor, and we'll meet up with him again a little bit later, as he developed in 1834 uh, an idea for Penny Post wrappers. This is Roland's most important mechanical invention. It's the rotary printing press. And he, he, he uh, developed this in 1835, just after the introduction of paper being made in long rolls. Um, unfortunately, the treasury stubbornly refused to use it for two or three decades. Um, and the reason for that is they, they wanted each page to be separated, tax stamped before anything could be printed on it. Uh, and their machines could only put out about 4,000 sheets per hour, where Roland's print here did eight times that much, about 32,000. Anyway, the, the rotary printing press came into being not on Roland's machine, but uh, in similar ones. Then came a turning point in history because of this uh, printing press. The Hill family gathered and they deliberated whether they carry on with this printing press with the prospect of big business or Roland continue with postal reform. As Roland says, they concurred in advising that the post office should be referred to the printing machine. And as this recommendation seconded my own opinion, I decided to act upon it. And so began the era and the push for postal reform. Uh, postage was extremely expensive in those days, and it was actually used as a form of government tax. In fact, during the Napoleonic Wars, it often would double uh, to fund wars. Um, in 1812, it was about four pence up to 15 miles and about eight pence up to about 80 miles. And it was based on mileage and uh, the number of pages. So what the public did to try and cut down their um, costings was that they would use single sheets and they would write vertically, horizontally uh, to try and uh, lessen the number of, of pages. And they'd also use cryptic messages on the uh, addresses. So the other great inefficiency was that each letter had to be logged in the post office and each post office it went through on the way to its final destination and on receipt. The letters were paid by the addressee, and this was hugely problematic as uh, frequently the, the poor people who received the letters didn't want the letters and they hid away, so the postman would have to go back many times. And Roland even recalls that his mother was very afraid of the postman arriving at their door when they, uh, before they started their school and they were very poor. And this was one of the big driving forces why Roland 
pushed from first to move forward. The other big abuse was the free franking abuse. In the 1830s, about 12% of all mail was conveyed under free franking. And it was for MPs, peers, and dignitaries. And what they would do is they would be seconded onto the boards of various companies. And then the companies would send all their letters free of charge through their uh, VIPs. This is a very famous uh, uh, sketch from by Henry Cole from the Post Circular. And uh, it shows the disproportionate weight of free and paid mail on the London to Edinburgh mail coaches. So see, here you see a little packet of letters that were paying its way, and everything else here was going for free. So it's obviously highly inefficient. Robert Wallace was probably the, the first of the, um, the pioneers for posting reform. He was a Scottish politician, um, and he started a royal commission to investigate the postal department in 1836. And Roland Hill was taking an interest at the stage. Robert Wallace forwarded him all the books and documents to study. And um, Roland took that. And in 1837, he published this famous pamphlet, which was called Post Office Reform, Its Importance and Practicability. Um, and in this pamphlet, he put forward the idea of prepaid postage and a uniform charge based on weight and not on mileage. The first edition of this pamphlet was marked private and wasn't released to the general public. He sent a copy of this to his friend, Charles Pelham Villiers, who was an MP, uh, who then passed it on to government. Here's a little letter in the collection, a little bit later showing a letter from uh, Charles to Rowland. Uh, it was received by the Chancellor of the Cheka, who was Thomas Spring Rice at that stage. Uh, he met up with Rowland and he suggested some improvements. And so Roland produced a supplement on 28th January, 1837. Uh, however, nothing much happened for the next month and Roland got impatient. So he produced a second edition. And this one he made public. In this edition, he um, mentions the use of a home letterbox. So the postman didn't have to uh, trace the people they were sending the letters to. And he also, um, said that there should be a receipt for important letters, and it's basically talking about registered, um, registered letters. And then the momentous paragraph from the second edition. And this was designed to help the, the poorer people and the people who were unaccustomed to writing letters. And he said, this difficulty might be obviated by using a bit of paper just large enough to bear the stamp and covered at the back of a glutinous wash. This is the first ever mention of the adhesive postage stamp. Roland then appeared before the Commission of Post Office Inquiry in February of 1837. Um, and here he was saying it was suggested by Charles Knight, as we mentioned before, the publisher, that the postage on newspapers might be collected by selling stamp wrappers at one penny each. Availing myself of this excellent suggestion, I proposed the following with uh, selling them the price uh, of one penny. Uh, he has a letter later as well in the collection with, uh, from Charles to uh, Roland Hill. Uh, so Henry Cole, he was very instrumental in the, the development of the adhesive postage stamp. He formed um, a group of bankers and merchants called the Mercantile Committee. 1838, and they were very vigorous campaigners for cheap postage who would benefit from the most. Uh, he entered into that um, post circular where his cartoon appeared, and then he was appointed Roland's assistant in 1839. Now, Roland mainly dealt with the, uh, the politics and the uh, implementation of postal reform, where Henry Cole actually did, dealt with the design and the printing of the Penny Black's stamps and letter sheets. So now poor old Sir Henry Cole has never appeared on a stamp. And Roland has uh, appeared on hundreds, which we'll show you later. It's not quite fair. There was plenty of opposition to Roland Hill from within the, the post office, particularly these two, the uh, Lord Litchfield, who's the postmaster general, 
He said, of all the wild visionary schemes I've ever heard of, it is the most extraordinary. And then Roland's nemesis was Colonel Maverley. He really hated uh, Roland. And he was the secretary. And he, he tried to block Roland at every turn. He said his scheme was most preposterous and utterly unsupported by facts. However, the, the ideas went before a parliamentary committee examining Rowland's scheme. Luckily, Robert Wallace was the chairman because it was actually a hung vote. And uh, Robert Wallace's final vote was the casting one. And so the, they recommended the scheme to parliament in March 1839. Went to the House of Lords where it was approved. It went on to Queen Victoria. She gave it the royal assent on 17 August 1839. And Rowland Hill was appointed to the Treasury to implement this uh, uniform penny postage. So the first thing that uh, as Cole and Hill did was they started a national competition with the Treasury Competition, 1839. This was open to the general public and particularly the artists, scientists, and it was a generous prize for the best idea for how they were going to do this postal reform. In the end, there was no actual winner. None of the ideas were actually used in the eventual stamp. Uh, but four awards of 100 pounds were given away. And uh, one of those actually was given to Henry Cole for one of his ideas. And in December, 5th of December, 1839, four pence any postage came out. So here you see a letter, which was dated the 4th of December, uh, delivered on the 5th. So it got charged nine pence. If it would have been posted the next day, it would have been charged four pence, like this letter here on the December the 5th. This was such a success that uh, a month later, they introduced the one penny post on 10th January 1840. Once again, we've got a letter here posted on January 9th, costing four pence. Posted the next day, it would have been one pence. Then they started working on the making of the adhesive postage stamp and the letter sheets. Penny Black was designed by an artist from the Royal Academy, Henry Kerbold. He was paid the, the princely sum of 12 pounds for the work. And the idea of using the Queen's head came from Roland, where he said, as a prevention against forgery, he said, there's nothing in which the minute differences of execution are so readily detected as in the representation of a human face. I would therefore advise that the head of a queen by one of our first artists should be introduced. And that they did. They used the image of Queen Victoria from the city medal uh, done by William Wyan uh, for the, the postage. The engraver was Charles Heath, completed in January 1840. It all went very quickly. His first die was rejected, second one completed 20th February, approved by the Queen on the 2nd of March. So things were moving at quite a pace now. So they started the printing and they decided to do a, a sheet of, of one pounds worth, 240 stamps, uh, with variable letting, letters at the bottom, A to L horizontally, H T vertically, and each one was punched in separately, which has been good for philatelists because you can identify wherever the uh, stamps come from, which plate. They also have this lettering around the edges of, of the, the sheet, and this is what it says here. And the significance of this is that you have a, if you have a stamp that bears any of this writing, it is considerably more uh, valuable than one that does not have it. The printer was an American, Jacob Perkins, who moved to London, and he printed high quality banknotes. And he, he was brought on to do the printing. They printed about 800 sheets an hour, first prints 11th April. And a lot of penny blacks were printed, about 68 million. And many, many of these have survived. Um, and so the penny black is actually not a rare stamp. Um, um, just depends on which plate it comes from and the quality and uh, the margins. Paper was fairly rough. It was uh, very variable in texture. Uh, you couldn't use silk security threads, which were they were using for the postal stationery. 
So they put in the small crown watermark. The gum was a problem. It was initially made of potato starch. And the problem with that is it wasn't a good adhesive and it, many of the penny blacks fell off, which is um, not good for philately because a retached stamp is considerably less valuable than the original position. And adhesives were only added uh, in 1855. So the one in the black and the blue were issued for visual use 183 years ago today. Wednesday, it was on a Wednesday, 6th of May, 1840. They were imperforate and they were canceled with red Maltese crosses at that stage. It was changed to black because of the uh, ease to which this, the red could be washed off. And it's a whole another talk. At the same time, the Malready envelope was and letter sheet was uh, issued. It was uh, designed by this cantankerous uh, Irishman, William Mulready. And Roland actually thought this was going to be the, the best uh, way to do it. And he, uh, his idea was that this was going to be paper of rather inferior quality for sake of cheapness, but to have the most beautiful design that can be obtained engraved in relief with certain engine work, etc. Um, unfortunately for the Mulready, got ridiculed very quickly indeed. As early as the 2nd of May, 1840, this article appeared in the Times, which says, we have been favored with the sight of one of the new stamp covers. And we must say we've never beheld anything more ludicrous than the figures uh, or allegorical device by which it is marked. And Roland Hill threw in the towel on the 12th of May when he said, I fear we shall have to substitute some other stamp for that designed by Mulready. The public have shown their disregard and even distaste for beauty. So within two weeks, the caricatures started appearing. And this is the, uh, our main collection is on the fantastic caricatures of the Mulready design. This is probably the most famous one for his comic envelope number one, drawn by John Leach. Here you see his famous signature here, which is a leech in a bottle. He was a famous artist from Punch. And it's a wonderful design showing a blinded Britannia, or the British lion, should I say, with a monkey on the back with a Napoleonic hat on it, and a very odd looking Britannia there, and multiple other spoof designs around the sides. And most of the caricatures uh, follow along similar lines. This is a, a pamphlet put out by Roland in 1841, reporting on the, the results of the post reform. In the first year of uh, introduction, uh, the amount of posts doubled. And then by 1850, doubled again. So it went up to about 350 million letters by 1850. Uh, initially, it was financially um, not uh, a great success, uh, but it returned to pre-1839 uh, levels by 1865. So when the government changed in 1842 from the the, the Whigs to the Conservatives, uh, Rowland was dismissed from the Treasury. And there was a big public outcry, but it, was, it didn't help much. So he joined the London and Brighton Railway, initially as director and later as chairman. And once again, Rowland got stuck in and started uh, reforming things. He lowered fares, expanded routes, and he developed these famous uh, British excursion trains, Sunday excursion trains from London down to the coast, which I think still exists to, to a degree today. Here you see a wonderful book by Susan Major on these early Victoria, uh, Victorian railway excursions. 1843, uh, whilst he was still out of the post office, he wrote a further pamphlet saying how he thinks that the post offices and personal services could still improve. He also suggested that the post office be separated from Treasury. And obviously, the incumbent government didn't think this was a great idea at all. In 1844, he produced a much bigger volume uh, where he was talking about the successes of the post reform. And um, I think it's most likely that he wanted to annoy Foreign Francis Bering, his nemesis, uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer at the time. Then when the government changed once more, the Whigs got back in office, Lord John Russell put Roland back into the post office and began, well, into the post office. He was previously in prison. Uh, he became secretary to the postmaster general and then secretary to the post office for the next 10 years. 
and we need him to retire into his aforementioned ill health. Retired in full pay, and Queen Victoria awarded him the princely sum of twenty thousand pounds, which is quite a bit today. Here you see one of uh, Top Gear, one of Roland's official stationery uh, when he was uh, official for the first of secretary. His stamp on it. He wasn't idle in his uh, retirement. Uh, his good friend William Gladstone persuaded Roland to serve in the commission, uh, looking at. The railways and trying to privatize or the government purchasing some of the private railways. We've got many letters between the two in the, in the collection. Roland was uh, awarded a, a number of uh, honors. He got the freedom of the city of Aberdeen and of London. He was a fellow of the Royal Society, he got the El very first Albert Gold Medal from the Royal Society of Arts. He got an an honorary doctorate of civil law from Oxford, and then he was knighted uh, commander uh, of the Knights of Bath, um, and that was in 1860 when he became a Sir Roman. During his retirement, he was very active in this political economy club, uh, which is a club that was founded in about 1821 and still exists today. It was limited to 30 members where they discussed ways to support free trade and a number of his friends uh, were present on the, on the, in the club with him. John Stuart Mill, who was the son of James Mill, who founded it. Edwin Chadwick, who's mentioned in this letter here from uh, Henry Cole to Rowland, uh, William Danston, and Henry Fawcett, who was the blind postmaster general, quite a famous chap and a very famous wife, uh, Melissa Fawcett, um, who you probably know about. He suffered a stroke in 1860. He never fully recovered from that. Tried to work, but found it too arduous. Um, and that's when really, he had to resign in 1864. He started writing a book, History of Penny Postage. And he gave it to uh, Arthur's son, George Burbick, uh, to complete after his death. You can see a picture of George Burbick. We've got a copy of the um, original volumes of, of that history of penny postage. Also in the collection, we have this uh, uh, carte de visite from Berlin to his uh, to Bernard Hill, and this was in his 83rd year when he was getting quite frail. And here you can see his normal signature. Roland tried to sign on the front here, and you can see his very shaky handwriting by that stage. So he died um, at the age of 84, 27th August, 1879, died at his, his home. Here was his home in Bertram House. He stayed there for 30 years. Uh, no longer exists. It became a car park at, at one of the hospitals there, the, the free hospital. Uh, and subsequently, the uh, repairs building at the Royal Free Hospital has been built on that site. And it's now fittingly uh, studies immune research. He had a state funeral, Westminster Abbey, and he's buried along, alongside James Watt uh, in the north arm of the little St. Paul's Chapel. So it's a, just a stone and throw away from where uh, the coronation is happening today. And you can go and visit his grave there. This is uh, an invitation to attend the funeral to Roland Hill's gardener, Mr. Wills. Uh, and then if you go into Westminster Abbey, you can go and see Roland Hill's bust um, near his grave. This is a wonderful um, uh, verse that was pinned to Roland after his, his death. And it says, Roland is dead. It needeth not the sir to give him title. Prithee, tell me where he dwelleth, pauper, peasant, prince or queen, to him that hath not deep indebted been. So, Fitting tribute to to Roland. He's also uh, the Roland Hill Fund was set up in 1882 by the post office, still exists today, and helps needy post office employees, pensioners, and dependents. 1997, the Royal Mail started the Roland Hill Awards for achievements in stamp collecting. As far as philatelic commemorations go, in 1840, the anniversary of the stamp, uh, Portugal was the first to bring out. A set of eight commemorative stamps, but most of Roland Hill commemorations appear 
on this 1979 commemoration of the death of uh, Roland Hill. 80 countries produced commemorative issues uh, utilizing Penny Black. So obviously images of Roland Hill and um, Mount Reddy's. So uh, quite a collectible. Uh, so we get over 80 of those. He's appeared on a total of 170 country stamps uh, through the years. Um, surprisingly enough, uh, South Africa, which was a British colony, uh, have no stamps at all featuring Roland Hill. I was really surprised about that. There's countries surrounding us, such as Botswana, Lesotho, Swaziland, all have uh, uh, centenary stamps uh, commemorating Roland Hill. Not quite sure why that took him. The last featuring of Roland Hill was uh, the 2015 Europhilic stamp, 175th anniversary of Penny Black. And I'm sure on the 200th uh, anniversary of the Penny Black, we should see quite a few more. Now, this is a thing I get asked quite frequently when I present people say, but what about James Chalmers? Wasn't he the first? Well, there was a huge to do between the two sons, Patrick Chalmers and Pearson Hill, after the death of both James Chalmers and Roland Hill, with uh, Patrick uh, saying that the T supposed stamp was designed by his father in uh, 1834, three years before Roland suggested that he's supposed to stamp. But the definitive work is produced by Anthony Wicks in 2012. And he's analyzed everything on the controversy and um, fully supports Roland Hill as the inventor of the postage stamp. Roland was a meticulous archiver, uh, assisted by his daughter Eleanor, who was his private secretary for 25 years. And much of his correspondence has survived, luckily, and we've got about 100 of his letters in the collection. Uh, just to show you two very interesting ones. This one was. Uh, you see how Roland always archived them with a number. And he would always write on the back what the letter was about um, and uh, usually a brief response about what he was writing back to them. To people. This letter here was from Basil Horn, who was a famous sea captain, naval captain, should I say. He also wrote uh, boys' books. And he proposed to, uh, to Roland that all the clocks should be set London Standard Time, because they were set in order you know, at different times throughout the kingdom. And uh, this was three months later after this. This was in July 1840. Three months later, it was implemented by the Great Western Railway. So obviously, Roland forwarded this to people in the railways, and they developed um, London Standard Time. And then about seven years later, the whole country uh, went over to London Standard Time, and then in about 1855, onto Greenwich Mean Time. This letter here I particularly like. It's got South African connections from Joseph Dalton Hooker, who was his dad actually um, uh, developed Kew Gardens and he took over. And he's moaning at Roland here that a packet of his dried plants from Cape of Good Hope disappeared in the post. And he was writing to Roland to try and trace these plants. So, Lastly, I'd like to just pay a little tribute to my dad, who started all the collection and my interest in philately. He passed away at the grand age of 90, and not two years ago. And he's uh, sorely missed by all of us. And uh, I think we've got some family around the world who are going to be watching this presentation. And, and, uh, his daughters in Sydney, Hobart, in Johannesburg, and my son in Canberra. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that bit of history as much as uh, I've enjoyed putting this together. And um, uh, hopefully we'll get some questions on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. That was really, really wonderful. I very much enjoyed listening to that. Um, please do, um, ev hi everyone who's attending, lovely to have you here. And um, please do put your questions for Rob in the Q&A at the bottom, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can talk. Um, but that was really wonderful. If you've got time, anyone who's watching, if you've got time afterwards, please do pop back into the show and visit the round tables and um, head to meet the PTS member booth dealers. Um, there's lots going on all day. 
um so it should be quite exciting but yeah if anyone's got any questions please do um please do ask away um As I see Robin Castle is one of the audience members here. Uh, and now Robin is putting out a fantastic work he's been working on for a very long time on these uh, Mulready envelopes and Tory envelopes. Robin, perhaps you can uh, add a little bit. How's the book going? Oh, hold on a minute. There we go. Hi, Robin. Isabel, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I can hear you. Yeah, Robin. Hi, how are you? Brilliant. Rob. Yes, well, firstly, a big apology. Um, we had a very busy day last yesterday, a very late night. So I'm unfortunately joined your talk halfway through. So you'll have to <laughs> let me um, have. Is there a way of seeing this? Um, yes, it's recorded. Brilliant. It is recorded. And Robin, you'll yes. be able to just pop back into the show. And in about an hour, it will be in the auditorium. You can just click join now and you can be able to watch it. Fantastic. Yeah. So, Rob, mm. well, we don't really want to talk about what I'm doing here, but we're going to have to in a certain way because it connects the two of us. But I was with Richard uh, all day uh, Thursday till about uh, 10 o'clock at night. We are way into the book. I'm assuming that you've been talking about some of your amazing caricatures. Uh, in this talk. No, we didn't actually. We very briefly touched on it uh, because it's such a big subject. It's a whole another hour and more on its own. So we just talked really about Roland. So you did. So you didn't really want to um, have a bit of a dig at him, then, really, which is what the caricatures <laughs> do, I suppose. Yes. yes. Well, anyway, the good news is um, it's 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 coming on very well. Um, the Royal have approved it to be in in two volumes uh, well. now, which it'll need to be because it's over seven hundred and fifty pages. And I don't know if I mean I'm assuming there are other people out here that can hear this. The reason we're talking about this is that. Um, Rob has a phenomenal collection of Mulready caricatures, which, of course, were lampooning uh, the, the great work of Roland Till and, and, of course, William Mulready around about 1840. And many of those books, were, many of those caricatures are in the book, and, and, and there are some really very important ones there. So I'm sure many of the people listening to this, if they want to find out more about that, will, will enjoy picking up a copy of that when it comes out as well. But um, um, Robin, I think... What's the What's the book about? You're writing the book, obviously. So it's, with... it's the Mulready caricature. Mulready, amazing. And you're writing so it with yourself or with a gentleman called with, Richard? With, with Richard Hobbs, with Dr. Richard Hobbs. So we've been both working on it for about 10 years. And, and it is effectively a, um, uh, an update of the most recent book, which was by Bodley Jarvis and Hahn about 40 years ago. But this is a full colour, all singing, all dancing, full provenance, every single caricature known, the full history of it of all of the com the comic envelopes, um, the various states, and um, I think a, a very, very, very important part of philately because it's right at the start, you know, we had the Penny Black, the Morally envelope, within a week, the public response effectively was what the the caricature was, and the, the response was they, they actually, I think they were okay with the stamp, but it was the, the caricature, as we know, that uh, that was the reason that the Mulready had to be binned. And Roland Hill knew that within a week, didn't he, Rob, really? He yes. was already yes, writing you that, it. you know. Yep. And, and, and that's how we ended up with the Penny Pink, which was a much more conservative uh, effort, I suppose, really, with just that little pink design in the corner. Um, but no, it's a, it's a very fun and interesting part of philately, you know, mm. and, and the development of it. And um, I know that you have a unbelievable archive of material so I, I am looking forward to seeing some of that a bit later um next talk rob yes <laughs> yeah, well, yeah yes. Well, maybe next year we can do the caricatures with robin in attendance we'd yes. love to do that yes absolutely that would yeah. be really fun we should yeah. definitely do that yeah thank you so so much robin that was brilliant thank you rob okay you. Well, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to know the questions I don't think there's. Um... I think everyone's rushed off to see the coronation. I think so. <laughs> by, by an umbrella, Rob. Ah. By an umbrella. It's raining currently, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so I'll, be, I'll be over in London in July, Robin, so hopefully we can get I'm, to meet. I'm going to be in London definitely, I think, on the 19th. Um, okay, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll send you a message.